What's up, and welcome to Clarity for Parents of Athletes, bringing you stories from professional athletes about their parents and how they were raised. My name is Gabe Nocer from aclearmind.com. So I, if you've listened to other episodes in the show, we focus a lot on the fact that people are born into this world and they come out a, a blank slate and then they get painted almost like a canvas by those that are closest to them, which are usually their parents, their siblings, then their social connections, all the experiences they have in life. And that forms their personality and it forms the decisions they make and it forms the way that they think even which that is what ends up making the, de- they end up making the decisions that they do based on the thinking that occurs on a regular basis and their belief system. So if you could pinpoint a couple things on what programmed you the most in your childhood, what do you think those were? Well, my father was a very successful scientist. He was probably the foremost in the world on meteorites. He has an asteroid named after him. He has a mineral named after him, Kyolite. It was an asteroid. And so he, and he was one, one of the first scientists back in New Mexico. I mean, one of the first scientists in the world. They sent him the moon rocks in 1969 to his lab in Albuquerque. It was oh, very wow. interesting. They had, they had a police escort. They flew into the airport there and they had a, they had a big uh, armored vehicle with the rocks and two police cars. And they and they took it to the lab, to his lab in, in, at, on campus. And uh, he was a very famous rock scientist. So, and he was successful. And so that put a little pressure on me. I, I, that made me realize that kind of set my goals of like, wow, I really need to be extraordinary. And that's why I put extra pressure on myself. And that's why I believe I had some of my temper problems was just trying to succeed too much. You know, mm-hmm. it was like, I had to, I had to look, I had to, you know, like with my sister being a successful, a, a great junior, just always having a person in my family that was pretty successful. And I had to basically, I didn't want to be considered the black sheep of the family. So uh, I, I would try to strive so much. And that was, it was good in the sense that I worked extremely hard. And I don't think my last few years in high school, there was anybody in tennis in the state who, who was working as hard as I did and who had these big goals. And I don't think, even in my yearbook, I look back, they say, oh, we'll see you at Wimbledon, but I don't really think any of my classmates ever thought that I would play at Wimbledon mm. because no one in New Mexico had ever done it. No one has ever played, played at Wimbledon in the main tournament, in the main draw. So I think the added pressure of just my parents' success, my, my dad and my sister, was what enabled me to do well, but it also enabled me to have my drinking problems and, and, and stressing out and having some of my mental health issues. That was, that was, so it was a double-edged sword, Gabe. Mm, wow. That's powerful. And it usually can be. And I, the clients that I work with, especially the athletes, I say, look, you can do things, the same exact thing, but from two different mentalities, you can do things from a place of needing to prove yourself and from needing to be successful and or anger and needing to be better than everybody else. Or you can do the same exact training from a place of pure love, love of your sport and loving to compete still and loving to be disciplined with your training. And it seems like some people can get caught off onto the other, the opposite side of that fact. And it seems like you did for some of your life while you still love tennis. Yes. Still had this yes, need. I did. I had this need to be as successful as my sister and my father in their field. And I did love the sport, but it became almost too much at certain times. And it affected my play on the court negatively because I, I you know, I, w- I did not want to lose and I would have these temper tantrums. And I was fine a lot on the tour, but I also, I mean, I'm not, I'm just saying these are some of the mistakes I've made. I mean, no one's perfect. And so that was the, 
but I definitely overall was a pretty good guy and I played pretty solid, but definitely the temper coming into play of people who knew me growing up. Uh, and I think that, you know, and that was this, that was the problem was just, I had, it was, but it was only inner pressures. No one else really cared. They still like Marky Kyle, you know, they had friends and it was, you know, it was nothing, it didn't really matter. But to me, that's the way I felt I needed to do just to prove to my father and to my sister that, and my, my mom who had come from some pretty, you know, they, they, they basically lived the American dream. They came over from the former East German country, speaking no English and, and then building a nice home in Albuquerque and blah, 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 and becoming very successful in, the, in this field and with my sister doing well. It definitely was an added pressure, but I put it on myself and that's what I would recommend to parents. If they're, the, the, it's all a external, when I look back is now I'm just relaxed and basically semi-retired in Honolulu. And this is where my father, after New Mexico, became a professor. Uh, and he did that, did work here for about 30 years after Albuquerque when I went to college. And that's the main reason I'm here. He's 85 and I see him. But when I'm looking back now, it's semi-retired, teaching some lessons, working at a hotel. I'm just like, geez, I didn't need to think that. People don't really, it, it was me putting all the pressure on. So if any of your kids, of uh, my parents, I would stress to them, it's, it's mostly the kids' pressure on themselves. And if you can explain to them that that there really isn't enough, there really isn't any pressure on you. It's just what you do for yourself because in the end, everyone has their own life. Everyone's doing their own thing. They forget about it 20 minutes after it's happened, like if it's in a soccer game, it's over. But you go home, you deal with it, you sleep with it, you eat dinner with your parents. The next day at school, you walk in, you think everyone is thinking, oh, there's the guy that missed the penalty shot in soccer. No, it's not that way, to be honest, uh, at least at the lower level. I mean, obviously, the, the Buffalo Bill kicker who missed it against the Giants in the 80s or the 90s, he's, mm. you know, he gets, he gets, he gets some he, – he feels bad. But I just feel like it's it, – and, and even if it's so that, you can deflect that, learn how to deflect, deflect that. See people like yourselves, life coaches. There's so many more options than there were when I was a kid. You know, psychiatry, psychology. You can definitely, uh, there's so many more options as far as just getting, releasing all this pressure and playing free because like Doug Flutie said, he was like the ninth guy on the bench and he had, there was like four. And when he got to number four, there was three guys, six, four or bigger that practiced really well, but he was relaxed when they played. And when they played, they were uptight. So that, that, that was the difference between him being a five ten player and, 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 but he was he practiced like he played, and most other guys couldn't handle the real situations on the field. And it's the same with with the pressure. If you can learn just to get rid of all of that external influences in your parents, even though they might mean the, you know that they, they, they give you a hard time about practicing tennis or something, they're, they're just they they just want you to they mean they mean well. And and but just try, if you can eliminate that extra pressure. I think would help an athlete's progression in life, most importantly, but even on a tennis court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The pressure. It's, you know, it's a, can be a difficult thing as a parent and to want to motivate your child, but also let them kind of follow their own path. Now I know your mom, you said earlier in the interview said like, Hey, if you're not out in 10 minutes after school, whatever you're you're whatever there's some kind of ex something that's going to happen essentially right yes 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 practicing right away no no question no question so there is that's essentially is pressure right there yes and you also had this kind of unconscious pressure was maybe conscious at times to be just as good as your dad and your sister as well do you, what do you think would have helped you hear from your family that would have maybe, I guess, released some of that pressure that you were experiencing? Seeing a uh, sports psychologist mm. and working, in, and in, even even another said working with a uh, sports psychologist, working with a physical trainer, which I ended up doing. I was one of the first double specialists to have a. a, a a trainer that I work with, uh, you know, after my tennis with weights and getting faster. So just like having, having a sports psychologist to deal with that would have been 
very important. And then getting a, a speed specialist. But of course, that all comes down to money too. People gotta mm -hmm. be able to afford it. But I'm sure there's free services every around around that, which I even found out about. You know, where you can get help. Uh, maybe not a sports psychologist, but you can still get help with the city and state with some kind of psychology, just any basic or reading books about it. I mean, if you don't even want to go see somebody, just reading books on how to deal with, with the parental per pressure. And uh, uh, I don't really think it was, because I obviously listened, let's put it another one. Remember, I'm not, the, I, I played in Wimbledon, but I'm not the Wimbledon champion. So, you know, <laughs> that, you know, that's one thing we want to make clear is that, all of this stuff was just, I guess I kind of look at it also as being normal. I'm sure you had your parents wanted you to work or to, or, you know, just discipline you in any ways, like cleaning your room, for example, it's mm -hmm. almost the same thing. Cleaning your room is exact. It's just as much as, as uh, going out and practicing tennis. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, cause it, you know, or eating your vegetables or, or behaving, being friendly to people, uh, mm -hmm. being kind to people can be just the same because your parents want you to be able to be self-sufficient. And if I would have just stayed around the house or went and played with my friends, even though Doug Flutie did the unorganized, see, I did it the other way around. My parents pushed me into some sort of organization of tennis. And that kind of helped me become more organized and just realize that, hey, I can do it at each level. And, and, but it was a slow progression. I never thought I would ever be able to play professional tennis because of uh, it was just a day-by-day -day thing. And that slowly just happened slow. I didn't say at 10 years old I was going to be a pro, whereas my sister probably did, and, and it didn't turn out. Her career didn't turn out. She had a fine career, but she, her career didn't turn out uh, like Tracy Austin's. And me, I had no one had any expectations except for myself just because of my family upbringing. No one else really around me thought I was going to do well. And that also made it easier for me to make a million dollars playing the sport and traveling around the world and playing against the biggest names and, and so forth. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So what about, what a kind of advice would you have for parents who are raising athletes who don't have access to a sports psychologist or, you know, who are just raising their kids normally within a sport or multiple sports? What advice would you have for them today? I would have them try to have their child compete as much as possible I know it takes money to play in events, but if, even if it's just competing in practice or uh, unor not, not so many organized, but competition is the key. And if people, if parents can't afford for their kids to have activities and get into something sport and they have to work right away, well, then that's just the way life goes. Uh, then, then they can be successful in business if they go work and they work at McDonald's and then they get that attitude of being uh, an entrepreneur and do that to business. But as far as sports, Competing is the most important thing. One, one of the most important things, competing. And as far as if you can't afford sports psychology, I read a lot. Of, I'm, I'm a voracious reader. You can check out books from the public library, sports psychology. Uh, I'm reading a book right now by H.A. Dorfman on coaching the mental game, which is leadership philosophies and strategies for peak performance in sports and everyday life. It's about a guy who's coaching coaches. I'm always trying to learn a little bit more but you can do it by just, I guess, in summary, um, compete as much as possible and uh, read as much as possible about getting yourself better, sh better shape physically, mentally, eating right, and so forth. Mm, that's great. And maybe there's a podcast you can recommend, a free podcast as well, right? Uh, yes, Gabe, please listen to it. Or if they can afford you to go take life coach, to go take life coach because you, I'm sure you're a very good life coach. If they can afford you to have sessions with you and let them vent out all their frustrations and, and get on a good plan. No question. Awesome. Well, Mark, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Your, your words are inspiring and your story is incredible. So thanks for sharing everything today. Thank you. Made my ego, it nourished my ego very much to, to say all this. Appreciate it. Have a nice day, everybody. So what were your biggest takeaways? This interview really confirmed something that one of my earlier guests said. Ashley McIver Demerit said, young athletes put so much pressure on themselves naturally. Their teammates put so much pressure on them and their coaches typically put so much pressure on them. 
The last place they need more pressure from is their parents. And this is so true and even confirmed by Mark in this episode. His father was a highly esteemed professor with an asteroid named after him, and his sister was a tennis phenom, ranked fifth in the nation, and Mark felt like he lived in her shadow and was always trying to feel as important as her and his father. Now, this was just internal pressure that I believe many children create in, in different circumstances, of course. Now, I had a personal experience that was similar. Both my parents were PhDs, and I remember literally telling people when I was young that I'd be a failure with just a master's degree compared to them. Now, luckily, those thoughts didn't last very long, and my parents never reinforced my irrational belief that I created and put pressure on me academically. Now, Mark, on the other hand, had this internal pressure, but also external pressure from mom who said he'd be grounded if he wasn't out at the tennis court in 10 minutes after he got home from school. So this combination of internal and external pressure simmered and was often on his mind, both consciously and unconsciously. Now that line of thinking basically gave fuel to the ego's ultimate fear of not being good enough. Now I'm sure you can imagine having that fear exist in one's thoughts, especially throughout childhood, can lead to a lot of emotional difficulties throughout life. Children who grow up with the strong fear of not being good enough try to keep that fear at bay in different ways. And by trying to prove that belief of not being good enough incorrect with accomplishments or by succumbing to the belief and growing up with a very low sense of self-esteem. Now, when those children become adults, the child who grew up running away from the fear of not being good enough can still chase the need to accomplish things to prove oneself, but that search will never end and can lead to substance abuse as it did with Mark, relationship issues, social issues, and, and so much more. And this is all because... Those children who grow up into adults believe that they can conquer their need to be quote-unquote good enough with something from outside of them. Now, as I've mentioned many times before, this is the outside-in illusion. It's an illusion because it's always our thinking about our accomplishments and anything else in our lives that truly creates our reality. Our thinking changes over time. The accomplishments never do change, but our thinking about it does. That's why... 100% on a spelling test in first grade feels awesome when you're in first grade, but after you graduate college, you don't even remember what that first grade spelling test feels like. And if I'm wrong and you still do remember what that first grade test feels like, kudos to you. You've got the secret right there. And material objects exist, but their importance usually diminishes over time. That's why a shiny new object is awesome when we first get it, but it rarely keeps its shimmer over a long period of time. Our thinking creates our reality. We live from the inside out, not the outside in. Now, what's interesting to me in Mark Kyle's situation is that he felt this pressure and felt the need to prove himself, and he was still successful at a high level in tennis. Now, why? Now, essentially, it was because he loved tennis, but also was seemingly forced to go practice a lot as a child. Now, this shows the importance of training and playing matches or games. You know, the more one does anything, the better one becomes. That's clear and obvious. But what can help anyone reach a higher level of anything is their heart goal. I spoke about this in the last episode I released, episode 23, that we often start doing something because we love it. We love so much about it, especially the way that we feel when and after we're doing it. But along the way... We start to lose focus on why we're doing it. We want to play our sport to get on a better team because of how we might be perceived socially or within our family. And for professionals, it becomes a job and there's always the chance that we can lose our job if we're not performing up to par. Essentially, we lose sight of what we felt like when we played our sport just to play our sport. And I'm sure Mark experienced the same thing. He loved tennis, but it became a lot about him feeling good enough about himself through accomplishments. His, his goal in tennis didn't fulfill his heart. It was always trying to fulfill his ego. Now, some questions we'll never know the answer to is how would Mark have done on the court if his sister wasn't as good as she was or never even played tennis and his mom still pushed him out the door after school over to the tennis courts. Now, would he still have been as motivated or 
would he have been as more motivated without trying to run out of his sister's shadow? Now, what would the effect on Mark have been if his sister was the same tennis phenom that she was, but Mark's mom didn't push him as much as she did? But of course, that wasn't Mark's destiny. So yes, he had a tremendous amount of success on the court, but as he said in the interview, quote unquote, made a lot of mistakes during his life. So was it worth it? And I'm throwing out a hypothesis that if Mark was introduced to tennis, but wasn't pushed as much by mom, that he might have been even more successful and maybe wouldn't have made some of those same mistakes that he mentioned. And we'll, of course, never know. But all in all, what always seems to come back to me is that these athletes all love their sport on a deep level. And it's basically a parent's job to make sure that love doesn't go away or turn into a different goal besides their hard goal. Put your children in the best environment for them and be a passenger in their car of life and make sure they know whatever they choose to do in life does not define who they are. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this and wish you a very happy holiday season. Much love to you and many blessings.